All right. So let's get started with chapter one. Um, chapter one just actually goes over some basic terms of pathophysiology just to introduce um, the layout for the course. Um, what I wrote on the board here is actually an outline um, that I think would be very good for you guys to utilize um, when you're writing your notes at home. Um, I do encourage you to make your own study guides at home. Um, try not to just take the PowerPoint and read through. Um, I, love, I know a lot of students like to study that way, but sometimes I feel like the information just kind of blends. And so it's easier to just kind of break it apart, okay, and just kind of make different outlines. Just the outline for each disease. So what you can do is actually put the disease topic, etiology, risk factors, pathogenesis, Signs and symptoms, which sometimes your book also puts it in a category is what we call clinical manifestations, and then treatment. Okay, and so we'll go over each one of these items um, in a little bit. Now, I also have here in red, this is just extra. <coughs> so PICS, so the picture that's associated with that particular disease topic, the lab value that's associated with that particular disease topic. So say, for example, later on when we go over atherosclerosis, we're going to also include lipid panel for that, so we'll include the panel for you know, that particular topic. So just um, keep in mind the labs that are associated with that disease topic. And then something here called hallmarks. Hallmarks, this is not a clinical term, but your book uses this term, and I really like it because it's kind of explaining something that stands out with that particular disease, okay, whether it's a particular gene or a particular diagnostic testing something that's uh, localized for that disease topic and that disease topic only. And these things are really good too to um, incorporate because when you're studying and if you see those items that will help you also in test questions and you'll know, okay, that's, you know, that's just for that. And, and that's that. And you can add whatever you like to your outline, obviously, but um, some students that are visual learners, sometimes they like to draw. Um, I even had a student one term um, <coughs> Once the first term she failed the course, the second term that she took the course, she actually wrote all her notes in color. And so she did each item in a different color, and for some reason that helped her a lot. So it's just a matter of how you learn and just figuring out that learning style to incorporate with the outline. Okay. So, pathophysiology, I want to start you off with the definition of patho first. Pathophysiology is the study of disease process. So pathophysiology is a study of disease process. Now, you guys tell me, where do you think disease process begins in the body? Where do you think disease process begins in the body? In the cells? Very good. It starts at the cellular level. So keep in mind that it means, uh, disease process starts at the cellular level. So remember in maybe anatomy, you guys went over the level of organization from a cell to a tissue to an organ to the organ system, okay? This is actually how we're going to break down disease process. We're going to go over how it starts at the cellular level, how it affects the tissue, how it affects the organ, how it affects the organ system, and how it affects the organism. So when we get to the point of the organ system and organism, this is where the patient signs and symptoms start to present. Okay, so that's how we want to work the material. Okay, so <clears throat> moving on to the first term that we have here, etiology. When you see the term etiology, etiology basically states the study of cause slash reasons for the phenomena, or to put it simple, the known cause of the disease. Okay, so etiology is going to be the known cause for the disease. So say, for example, a uh, person that has strep throat. So strep throat, the known cause of the disease is actually streptococcus bacteria. So we know that that particular bacteria is the known cause, and that's the issue. Now, if we were to say, for example, um, atherosclerosis, if a person has atherosclerosis, we can't say, oh, well, if you go and eat that Krispy Kreme donut, okay, and you go to Popeye's and eat that uh, two-piece chicken dinner, that that's automatically going to give you atherosclerosis. We can't say that that's a known etiology. That is a possible risk factor, but it's not the known etiology. Now, when you have causes that are unknown, they do go under a different category that are called idiopathic. And we do know that a number of diseases are idiopathic. So when you guys make your outlines, um, it is a big possibility under the etiology portion that a lot of times you'll be putting unknown. 
Um, a lot of diseases do have an unknown uh, cause. However, a whole list of risk factors for it. Now, hydrogenic, um, this is a topic, or I should say a category where it says cause results from an unintended or unwanted medical treatment. So to give you an example, say we have a patient that has some sort of surgery, maybe a hernia repair, whatever. Um, after post-op, they're given some pain medication like Norco, Vicodin, or whatever to take home and make them feel better, okay, all the good stuff. And so now when they take that Vicodin and Norco, those types of medications, what happens, they cause a reabsorption of water in the intestines, so it makes the feces actually really hard. It makes the stool hard. So now these patients have constipation. And now you have to give them a stool softener for that. So what happens, and we know that sometimes medications do have side effects, and then now you have to give a medication for the side effect in this whole cascade event. That sort of falls under this category. Okay, so we have something that was unintended, however, it still needs to be addressed. Okay, so, okay. Now, risk factors. <coughs> So risk factors are what we call the likelihood of developing the disease. Okay? So a risk factor is the likelihood of developing the disease. Not the exact cause, but just the likelihood. So let me write on the board. This is broken down into two categories that they don't have listed here, so I have to write it down. Does everyone have this? Can I erase it? Yes. Okay, so let's just add here pre-existing conditions. 
uh, the ones that are modifiable. Okay. And most pre-existing conditions can be modified again through pharmacology or whatever type of surgical procedure, whatever needs to happen. Okay. So that's that. Now let's go over to non-modifiable. Okay. What are some things that cannot be modified within the human body? Genes. Genes. So genetics, and I'm going to say also slash family history, because you'll see that more listed, I should say, excuse me, on the intake form, family history. Okay, so we cannot change that. Sometimes we want to change our family, but we can't. <laughs> so that is definitely not modifiable. What else? Something else we cannot change about ourselves. We can change the appearance of it, but we can't change it. Age. What gender? Gender, yes. everyone's always afraid to say that. Um, please understand with gender, um, in this, uh, one of the nursing instructors, she had an issue um, with a student who were disputing the test question and said, oh, what if the patient was transgender and so forth. Um, understand that when a person becomes a transgender, um, it is more of a social aspect, so they're changing their appearance, okay, of their gender. However, they do not change the genetics. Okay, so the genetics, that person is born with the genes of the sex that they're born with, which means they follow the same risk factors for that sex that they're born with. So that does not change from a biological aspect. From a social aspect, yes, it can change. So some, I have to say that because sometimes people are afraid to say gender and they don't know, is it modifiable or not. Um, but from a biological standpoint, it is considered to be non-modifiable. Okay, what else? What can you not change? Look at your skin. Okay. Ethnicity. Okay, so these are things that you cannot change. Okay, so risk factors again, just make sure you know and understand that things that are considered to be modifiable and things that are non modifiable. Uh, so we know with certain diseases and things that are not modifiable, it's just part of that risk factor, not much you can do about it. However, um, with your nursing interventions, you would focus more on the things that can be modified through lifestyle changes, um, medication and treatment, things like that. Okay, so let me give you a scenario um, that works in the pathogenesis, and I'll use some of the risk factors. So let's use atherosclerosis. I always use this uh, example. It's a good example. Let's use atherosclerosis slash coronary artery disease. Okay. So atherosclerosis, I think we all know that this is plaquing, okay, that builds up an artery, okay, that it plaques. And so let's use some of this. So let's say we have a 67-year-old male. Uh, let's say he's African-American. And let's say has a family history of heart disease. And let's say he's overweight. And I'm going to say he's newly retired, okay, and um, overweight, and also has a pre existing condition of diabetes, okay. And so keep in mind, adding in that pre existing of diabetes, when patients that do have like uncontrolled diabetes, um, if they have a poor diet, and it's not just only obviously in sugar, but usually they have a poor diet as well in fat and tea. So um, that kind of goes hand in hand. So let's say he's home, enjoying his retirement, and just eating whatever he wants and just lounging around. So imagine if you just take a snapshot into this gentleman's blood vessel. So let's say his blood vessel has a lot of lipids flowing through, flowing through. Now, do you think that lipids actually have a nice circular shape or do you think they have like a jagged maybe abnormal looking shape? They do have a jagged abnormal looking shape which means as they're flowing through the bloodstream what could possibly happen is this. That lipid could nick the inside of the endothelium of the vessel. 
When that occurs, that is an injury. Okay, and because this lipid is a crazy looking shape, it's gonna start causing injury to the wall. So when that injury occurs, what do you think is the body's response to the injury? Say that again. Patch it up. Patch it up with? The cholesterol. Uh, not the cholesterol. What is it gonna patch the, the neck with? Platelets. Platelets. So understand, yes, we will have the platelets come to the side and try to close up the hole, but then there's another piece to that also. What is the other piece that's going to be introduced if we have an injury? Inflammation. Very good, the immune system, okay, and inflammation. So understand that white blood cells will definitely come to the area. And in particular, macrophages. We know that macrophages are pretty much along that first line of defense and they're just gonna do kind of a clean sweep type thing. So when these macrophages come, they're actually gonna to try to eat the lipid because the lipid is a problem in the first place so they just wanna get rid of it. When the macrophage comes to eat the lipid, the problem is this. The composition of the lipid and the macrophage really don't match, so what'll happen is it'll actually oxidize. And it'll just kind of blow up and now make a foam cell. So now this little tiny lipid, whatever it was, now becomes a bigger situation. As you said before, yes, we do have platelets coming, and so keep in mind that the endothelial wall is still kind of regenerating and healing, which means that those cells are going to develop over, over, over that foam cell. And now what you have is a fixated plaque in the wall, okay? So what I just explained to you is the pathogenesis of how an atherosclerotic plaque forms in the vessel wall. Um, so let's take this further. If that plaque is in a coronary artery, what is the issue here? Oxygenate, lack of oxygenated blood getting to the heart, and in particular the heart muscle. What type of sign or symptom is your patient going to have because of that? Not high blood pressure. Chest pain, very good. Angina. Keep in mind, the heart muscle is being starved of oxygenated blood. So the very first thing that's going to occur, because it's the anaerobic route of metabolism, the very first thing that's going to occur is that angina, that tightness okay, mm -hmm. of the muscle. So um, the whole point of explaining that is just so you can see how we're going to take this information. Okay, So we have to break it down. Why does the patient have angina? Okay, So understand what's happening with the muscle fiber. What is it? Is it a lack of oxygen? Is it a blockage somewhere? Why is it a blockage? Is it in the wall? Okay, so we need to uh, go over that material. Now, another thing. Remember how I said that the macrophage comes and eats the lipid and it oxidizes? Well, I want you to know that oxidation reactions are actually one of the first things that occur when disease process develops. Okay, um, and you can drop that down. So oxidation reactions are usually the first thing uh, one of the first things that develops when disease process occurs. Okay, so oxidation reaction. So, um, and that's with any disease process. And we're going to go over this again uh, in a little bit. So, I think that's that. Okay, so let's move on. So clinical manifestations. Under clinical manifestations, they do have here the category of what we call our signs and symptoms. Sometimes you'll hear people say signs and symptoms like it's the same thing, but there is a difference between a sign and a symptom. Okay, so we'll go over that now. A symptom is what they say the subjective feeling of the abnormality in the body, or to put it in simple terms, what the patient states. So the subject is the patient, so what the patient feels. So if the patient states, um, I have cramping, um, I have numbness, tingling, or I feel lightheaded, or nauseous, okay, whatever it is that they're feeling, um, that's what we call the symptom, okay, the symptoms that they're feeling. A sign is what we call an objective or observed manifestation. So what you observe as a clinician. So you look at your patient, you can tell that they're pale, okay, you can see edema, um, you can see maybe bruising, okay, on their skin, or whatever it is that you're observing. This is also very important to know because when we look at, and I'm not sure if you guys utilize the same exact format, um, but in most clinical settings, um, they use a progress note called the SOAP note form where it's S-O-A-P. So subjective, 
for the subjective findings or what the patient is stating. Objective for the O for the objective findings of what you find. A for the assessment and then P for the plan. So that's kind of the outline that um, is used uh, pretty much across the board for progress notes how you would chart for patients, for patients chart. Again, I'm not sure if you guys use that same as that format in nursing. I think you guys use something else. Okay, now the next thing here is syndrome. Syndrome is what we call a set of signs of symptoms not yet to determine or delineate a disease. Okay, so what does that mean? A very good example that I can give you, um, the only example I have for this is AIDS. AIDS is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, meaning that it is a set of signs and symptoms, a set of diseases that's all kind of happening at one time. Okay, it's a syndrome. So when a person is diagnosed with full-blown AIDS, by that time they have a, a lot of number of different diseases and situations that are occurring. So we can say that, okay, well that particular sign is from the Kaposi sarcoma and that's from the toxoplasmosis. So it's kind of difficult to figure that out, but it's just because it's all combined. <coughs> so the next thing we have here are what we call stages in clinical course. So there is something called a latent period and a prodromal period. You guys may have heard of this before, I'm not sure. Uh, but a latent period is the time of exposure to uh, the tissue, to the injurious agent, to the first signs and symptoms. Prodromal is when you have the signs and symptoms and then now the disease process is kind of coming full blown. Now what happens here is that Sometimes in a latent period, signs and symptoms may be present, and if they are, they're very mild, okay? Uh, so let me give you an example. Say you're on a plane. The plane's always crowded and confined. You feel like you're packed in there. And so let's say that someone coughs or sneezes. They don't cover their mouth, and you unfortunately inhale. Okay. So now you have inhaled, okay, and been exposed to whatever it is, kind of airborne thing that they have going on. So when your body comes into contact with that particular virus, what's going to happen is that the latent period, you will start to maybe develop, if so, a very mild sign of symptoms. So say you may have a little tickle in your throat, maybe a little post nasal drip, okay? But then when a prodromal period where the disease really starts to develop and have the onset, then now that tickle in your throat turns into a full-blown cough, the post nasal drip now turns into a full congestion, and all of that. So. Now, subclinical stage, this is where the patient functions normally and disease processes are very uh, well established. So what does this mean? This means that any one of us in this room could right now maybe have asthma, maybe have thyroid condition, maybe the ulcerative colitis, okay, whatever may be going on. However, um, the disease process is well established, but you're still able to have most of your quality of life. Okay, so it's not something that's going to decrease your quality of life completely. Uh, we'll talk about some clinical stage. Acute clinical course and chronic clinical course. Um, this is important to know. Sometimes some diseases are acute, some are chronic. When you have an acute type of disease, please understand that the disease actually progressed very fast. Okay, that's why they say a short-lived, it progressed very fast, and not only that when you have a disease process that goes really fast, the outcomes are worse. Okay, so they have really, really bad, or just to say, severe manifestations. So very fast, more severe manifestations. Um, chronic clinical course. This is when we have a disease process that actually develops a little longer. It takes a little longer for it to develop. Now, I don't want you to think that this is a better situation. Sometimes it just depends on the disease. However, uh, just to give you an example of something that's not that great. Some of the 9-11 workers, as you guys know, have developed occupational lung diseases. And so with occupational lung diseases, they take a long time to develop. So from that exposure, from what happened on 9-11, exposed to whatever chemicals and anything that was in the air, now this developed in the lung and it actually took, let's say, Sometimes occupational lung diseases take somewhere between seven to 10 years to even come out as far as any signs or symptoms. Now when the signs or symptoms come out, the issue is this, um, it's sort of too late. Okay, so I don't want you to think that 
that's always a good thing to have a slow process to develop. Now, <clears throat> can a chronic situation happen from an acute? Yes. So say, for example, if someone falls down, okay, and fractures a limb, with that fractured bone, the bone heals, okay, that's great. However, <coughs> is that person at risk for maybe having degenerative changes around that bone or in the joint? Yes. So then that would be the chronic situation that occurred from the acute injury. So we have another topic here called exacerbation and remission. I'm trying to stay in the camera. Okay, so exacerbation is an increase in severity of signs and symptoms. Remission is going to be a decrease. So this actually is something that is part of a lot of different diseases. So we have, say for example, Ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, um, that's a good example. Sometimes these patients have exacerbations, sometimes they have remissions. It just depends on uh, when it's going to get active. Um, in your book, they state that when a patient goes into remission past five years, they say that person is said to be cured. Okay. Now, we know we can't say that for everything, and especially when we talk about cancers, because we have all heard of stories of a person being in remission for cancer, seven, 10, 12 years even, okay, and then all of a sudden, here we go, okay, with another um, outbreak. So just keep that in mind. Um, even though sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, the person's cured of cancer, uh, they use that term loosely. However, the proper term really is to say that that patient is in complete remission. And the goal of cancer treatment is to keep that person in complete remission for as long as possible, okay? So we'll talk about that um, more so later on. Okay, so covalence is the stage of recovery after disease, injury, surgical procedure. So just kind of like, I don't want to say just post-op, but post-disease and post-injury. Um, sequela is a subsequent pathological condition resulting from an acute illness. Kind of like adrogenic, but I'll give you a better example. Sepsis. We know that sometimes patients go into the hospital for one thing, after they go in for that one thing, they can develop an infection. If that infection goes untreated, unfortunately that infection can spread down a patient's septic. That sepsis, unfortunately, can progress very fast as we know what happens with sepsis, and now this patient can possibly lead to organ damage and failure and death and all that. Okay, so um, that's a good example. Sepsis of a sequela, because uh, when sepsis occurs, most of the times it is a sequela of events, of things that just happen way too fast. Okay. Now, this is something I wish I didn't have this in the video. I should have took out these next three slides. So, you guys are going to cross out 9, 10, 11, and 12. Considerations. Okay. 
Um, you guys will be taking, or probably are currently taking, cultural course. Okay, and again, that course, uh, even though you go over a lot of information, but the main focus of that course, honestly, is so you guys can understand how different cultures view health and wellness. Okay, because each culture look at health and wellness differently. Some cultures that may come from more of an indigenous background may actually uh, do types of healing that are actually more like herbal remedies and things like that, um, where they kind of self-treat, where you may have certain cultures that are more focused on the spiritual aspect, okay, of how they treat health and wellness. So it is important to understand that. Another thing, too, that I would add in is definitely religion. There are some religions that have to have bloodless surgeries. Um, also, you want to look at ethnic and genetic issues as well, or genetic disorders that are more for like certain ethnic groups. So say for example, sickle cell anemia is common amongst African Americans and people of Mediterranean descent, whereas Tay-Sachs disease is more common amongst people of Jewish descent. So just kind of knowing, okay, which genetic disorders would be associated with different uh, ethnic groups. Okay, age and biological factors. So believe it or not, if we have something that may be normal at one age as a child, may not be normal as an adult. Some things as an adult, as an elderly person may be normal, may not be normal for a child. So let's use, for example, aging. What happens as we age, as we get older? What goes on? Certain things we start to lose and break down. Muscle, bone. Muscle, bone, definitely bone breaks down and so this definitely can lead to osteoporosis okay so the bone can weaken especially more so in women especially postmenopausal uh, what happens when the bone starts to weaken this can now possibly lead your patients into pathological fractures depending on how severe the osteoporosis is what else happens as we get older the metabolism starts metabolism down. slows down very good um, which makes everything kind of slow down so say for example um, hypotension. Hypotension is not such a big, big to do, not like hypertension. However, when hypotension is diagnosed, sometimes you will see it more so in elderly patients because as you get older, things tend to slow down. Circulation slows down and things like that. So the blood pressure tends to lower, especially physician women too. Um, what else? Hormones. 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 Hormone production tends to slow down. Two things, and I can think of reproductive. Um, men actually do have a decline in testosterone, okay, as they get older. Um, we know women have a decline in estrogen, okay, and things like that. So not like, women go through menopause, not that there's a menopause, but uh, men also do have a decline, which they do believe sometimes can affect the prostate. So that's another thing we'll get into. Um, what else happens as we age? Immune system, they are definitely more vulnerable to different types of uh, infections and things like that because everything is uh, lower, so a lower in count. Um, what else happens? Elasticity. Elasticity, everything goes south. Okay, and that's something that we try to prevent as we get older. And keep in mind that we lose collagen. Okay, collagen is not only made up in the 